my best friends and engineer. I'm Libby. And I'm Lexi. And today we have an interview for you um, from someone who works on the executive council for Theta Ta. So that was a really cool perspective. We talked all about, she's the diversity, equity, and inclusion chair for um, the executive council of Theta Ta. So we talked a lot about how you can be an ally to women and other minorities in STEM and just like what we as women and any other people listening can do to empower each other in this industry. Yes, we also talked about her personal experience in Theta Ta, which I love to hear about because it's so interesting, you know, learning about how other chapters and how other schools do things differently than Miami did. And then she's also a validation engineer. So that was like cool that you guys got to Yeah, that that was cool. Have you ever talked to some another like, have you ever talked to another person like in the industry? Like meeting another person in validation like that? Um... Honestly, not outside of my first role, because I was yeah. a lot of younger younger people, um, and then there were some girls also, but not too many are focused yeah. on validation at my current company, honestly. So it was kind of cool. It was exciting. Yeah. I was like, do people get mad at you too? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's cool to get another perspective. Um, well, yeah, I guess- definitely. I guess we can, I think we can jump right into the episode for our listeners. This is like the third episode we've recorded in two days. So we don't really have an update to give like each other and the episode we recorded with Raven. We can talk about what we had for lunch. So would you have Oh, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That's the only update. Uh, That's the only update. I ran to Walmart in between and I ended up getting some Panera bread mac and cheese like you know the ones that we used to get all the time from the market at Miami um oh yes you know like those cups of mac and cheese they have them at yeah. my Walmart so yeah. I went and got that and that's what oh, I ate nice what did you eat <laughs> do, do they have the big ones wait do they have the big ones or do they have the small ones only what do you mean like you know the cups that you got they're like at the market they're downsizing yeah yeah, yeah. but they're what yeah like I don't know. Maybe they're doing like a health kick or something. Panera I don't know, is. Like jewel, but <laughs> how dare well, them? Well, no, it wasn't at Panera. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But oh, um, dang. So I I made a yogurt bowl. I had a nice little Yum. yogurt bowl. Yum. So yes, but we are feeling hungry. So right after we're feeling this, hungry, we're gonna... <laughs> and I feel like I'm gonna go pass out on the couch after all of the speaking we've done to each other in the past few days. I am the type of person that I get really drained after like talking a lot. So like when we do these interviews after I'm always like, you know, like it just Mm -hmm. takes all my energy away. So I know, but it's so exciting in the moment. Like I feel like I have like, I don't know. It's exciting talking to people who have similar interests. And then after when we're all done, I'm like, okay, time for bed. Yeah. Like I need a nap. (laughs) But so um, that was a splendid update. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, a little lunch update. So, shall we? So, we posted something on our Instagram, and the question was, What's one thing the podcast has helped you with so far? Um, so, we kind of wanted to change what responses we're reading out loud just because mm-hmm. I don't know. We got to change it up. We got to spice it up a little bit. Yeah. So, I can, I can read one. Um, so, Amy Rose678 says that. Um, this podcast has helped her find women working in STEM on socials, which Love I think that. is a thing that Libby touched on. Yeah. Libby touched on how there's not too big of a community or too significant of a community um, that kind of promotes women in STEM, but mm-hmm. we're getting there. We're building it. Yeah. Um, and let us know what you guys think of doing this for reading out responses on the um, podcast. We want to figure out a good way that we can incorporate our audience. So that's why we've been reading the reviews. But if you guys have any other ideas, let us know in your review on Apple Podcasts or send us a DM. Um, but this person said, um, I would love to see more episodes about daily life tasks, like what you do. What you do when you go to work, I understand the school aspect, but I want to learn a little bit more. And yeah, I feel like it's so hard to talk about um, like what you do every day. Like I totally see what she's saying because I can tell you all, all day long that I'm a project manager in the power generation industry, but like what does that actually mean? And I feel like we're both like you just get so used to the, what your day looks like that you don't think it's important or you don't think it's exciting so it's like oh like I'm not gonna tell that about like tell them about that little daily Mm -hmm. task I do because 
it's like not important, but yeah, I could see how that would be, you know, something that people would want to learn more about. Definitely. Yeah. I remember there was like one, like series consecutive weeks that I was just like only giving updates about my sterilized samples. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, honestly, if we go, if we do like a deep dive episode about like different tasks like not even day-to-day routine like just different things that can come up that would be good yeah because I feel like there's also like a confidentiality like aspect of Mm -hmm. our roles so it's like some things we can't really say but if we think about it maybe we can make an exciting yeah that would be a good episode episode out of it definitely well um we'll go ahead and get into the episode with Raven I hope you guys enjoy it and if you liked the episode be sure to share it with your friends or share it on your socials Welcome back to My Best Friends and Engineer, and we have another great interview. Uh, we are interviewing Raven. Do you want to give us a little background? Yes. Um, so, hi guys, my name is Raven. Uh, I am another alumnus of Theta Ta, the professional engineering fraternity, um, and I volunteer nationally with that. Uh, I also am a trained chemical engineer who works at a pharmaceutical company. Um, so I work uh, in validation processes um, and technical operations. So like running the actual system and making product for patients. Love a fellow validation engineer. <laughs> it's it's a hard job. It's it's not so fun telling people no sometimes. <laughs> right? It's it's you know, you got to learn how to do it, but slowly and slowly surely. but surely. I feel like it's harder sometimes as a woman. Um it was interesting cuz my validation team is actually all women. Um so I feel like we oh, yeah, cool. I feel nice. like we get to like boost each other up a lot and and stick up for each other, which is really cool. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, it's always so intimidating telling someone, you know, an older, you know, man who's been working for what, 20 yeah. years in the engineering department, we can't do this because, you know, of XYZ and they're like, it's not practical. I was like, I know, but <laughs> we have to do it we have to do it like or no you can't do this thing until this other thing is done that's just how the rules work yeah. exactly I feel like I would not be good at that because I don't like confrontation <laughs> so props to you guys for doing that it's all about the tone yeah yeah, yeah. or or making friends with the higher up so that when they say when they push back you can just will say well so and so who's the director of this entire team also uh agrees with yeah. me so who are you going to listen to <laughs> yeah right that's good advice <laughs> speaking of validation what made you want to you know pursue chemical engineering and um enter you know your career with a validation position so this is a question that's always a little hard for me to answer because my route to engineering is very unorthodox in that I didn't mean to do engineering at all. Um, So when I was in high school, I actually want to be a veterinarian. I want to work in like wildlife medicine, um, which I still want to do, but I'm like waiting to go down that path right now. Um, But I originally was applying to colleges for chemistry or biochemistry as a major. Um, But the school I ended up going to, I don't know if it was a paperwork mix up by the administration office or if my mouse slipped when I was selecting my major on my application, but I ended up getting accepted for chemical engineering instead of chemistry, like all the other universities. Um, But it came with more scholarships and more opportunities. And um, my dad is like a software engineer and my mom works in medicine. So both of them, they were like, okay, well, if you ever decided not to go into veterinary medicine, or even if you just decided to take a break after college, like this could be a really cool opportunity for you and could provide like a better backup than if you did chemistry Mm -hmm. and then decided like you didn't know what to do next. Um, So I ended up trying it, went my freshman year, really loved it and just stayed. Um, And then I got the opportunity through a scholarship to co-op with Toyota, which got me um, experience in manufacturing. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was really, really awesome um, to be able to do that. And it, taught me a lot about manufacturing and I realized like hey I actually really really enjoy this and like the sort of problem solving and like thinking on your feet that needs to happen in those situations um so then uh there was a career fair my senior year where Merck was present they had a little booth set up so I ended up talking to them I think for like just a couple of minutes I did not think I was even going to get an interview from them or like any sort of callback um but they ended up scheduling me for an interview and then I got it and I've just been here ever since yeah, that's awesome. Nice. Um, did you have any, while you were an undergrad, did you have any, I know you said Toyota 
um, you mm-hmm. had the chance to intern with them. Was that your only internship experience or um, was there anything else that you did throughout undergrad that helped you get some of that experience to build up your resume? Absolutely. Yeah. So I did two intern- two summer internships with Toyota, but I also did research um, as an undergrad with one of my Ooh. professors. So um, that was really cool. We worked in, uh, it's a process called flash nano precipitation, but basically we made like nanoparticles and we were binding protein materials in the center of the nanoparticle, um, which was uh, ideally like meant to be uh, a potential model for delivering medicine for like breast cancer, ovarian cancer, um, wow. different types of targeted cancers. Yeah. So the idea was that you could bind the uh, the treatment molecule effectively to the protein in the center of the nanoparticle, um, and then it would be delivered to the tumor safely as opposed to affecting all other like fast growing cells like hair and skin and, and other things that people that are going through cancer treatment typically have side effects from. Wow, that's awesome. So you mentioned that you were a part of Theta Tau during your undergrad. Um, can you talk more about your undergrad experience with Theta Tau? Um, were there any other like professional engineering fraternities on campus that you were kind of deciding yeah. on and kind of what made you want to join Theta Tau? So Theta Tau, I, I feel like most people hadn't heard of it uh, before they came to college or before mm-hmm. they actually met people from it. Um, but I grew up in Greek life. I grew up around like the Divine Nine, Panhellenic uh, sororities and fraternities. So I came to college knowing that I wanted to do some form of Greek life. And I found myself in this world of engineering that I'd never heard of, that I didn't know anything about. And so I was like, (laughs) okay, it's probably a good idea for me to try to find some sort of cohort or group that can support me through this. Um, And during the rush week at my school, we don't have a professional council for for Data Talk to be a part of. So they're considered just like a standard social organization, um, like a student org, like like any other club. Um, so they actually rush and like do all their marketing and stuff with all the other student orgs and the big like welcome week for all freshmen. Um, so I was going Mm -hmm. through there and I saw them and I was like, this is a random thing. Who knew co-ed fraternities existed? Um, so I went to talk to them and I was like, y'all are nerds. You're my people. Um, this seems really (laughs) cool. (laughs) Uh, and yeah, I just went to all the rush events. And I was like, this seems like a really cool idea to have just a professional networking group that's also legitimately friends and legitimately bonded together. Um, and it just, I don't know, it just really spoke to me. And I just felt, uh, I just felt really like pulled, I guess, by the organization. Um, and my big currently, he uh, actually was one of the first people that I ever met. And when I wasn't able to rush my freshman year because of my age, because you have to be 18 to be initiated, um, I had to mm-hmm. wait to come back the next year. And I was debating whether or not I actually wanted to come back. But like months after I had rushed, I think it was like March by this point of my freshman year, I ran into the guy who's currently my big, um, just in the hallways of the engineering school. And not only did he remember me from my rush period, um, but we like sat and had like a really cool conversation and just like called up and just like built a legitimate like bond of friendship um and camaraderie and so he's honestly like the reason i came back the next year and the actual reason that i joined the organization yeah that's awesome that's awesome how long is the uh i'm just curious how long is the rush process at your school because um i think lexi correct me if i'm wrong but i think typically for the whole process it takes almost a month between all the rounds and everything that we do so, so or even how long was I that would say that's you? right. Yeah, so for ours, um, the actual rush process is a little bit shorter. So every like pledge committee or, or new member education committee um, kind of does their own thing because there's mm-hmm. very little consistency. Um, but we would typically do about a week for rush and then we would do um, an interview, like a week of interviews after the initial rush week. So once you signed up for an interview, um, you had to do, you didn't have to attend a rush event if you like knew someone uh, in the organization already, but you had to do an interview to at least get a bid. Um, And so we would do bids typically at the end of that total two week process. And then our actual new member education process was like the entire semester. Okay. Yeah. Wow. We, we went through like three rounds at Miami. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like informal and then it's like an event and then like 
formal interviews and then like another thing or something but yeah it, so I, it's cool to like yeah, hear what? perspectives from different schools <laughs> definitely and were you involved in any positions while you were while you were involved in undergrad yeah so my my first semester <laughs> um, as a brother I was co-chair of two com- committees. I did philanthropy and public relations. Um, and then shortly after that, I, oh, wow. I did another committee that I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but then I became vice regent. Um, and then after I served as vice regent, I served as regent. And then my last semester, I served as like assistant to the new member educator. Cool. Nice. So very involved. Yeah, it it kind of became my life a little bit in college because like all of my friends, um, like I had other friends from high school that I still hung out with and I still hang out with. Um, But yeah, when I got into Theta Tall, like I just, I felt like I really found my people. Um, And we were such a large group that you could pretty much have like 80% of your friends just in the fraternity. Yeah. How large was your chapter at your school? Um, So our chapter was typically, the largest we got to while I was active was like 50, I think. Um, But the smallest we were ever at was like still in the high 30s. Yeah. Okay. Nice. I think that aligns with Miami. I think we were maybe at one point like 80 people. But um, so I feel like that's pretty big. But um, yeah, typically, I think at least like 50 people were in it. But, yeah, yeah. It, was, I, I, it was hard finding a room for meeting <laughs> yes. at one point. <laughs> yeah. Definitely had that issue. Which is interesting because there were some chapters that are like 100 plus people. And I'm like, how do you do anything? Yeah, where do you I go know, right? <laughs> to <Yeah>. meet? <laughs> just like a huge auditorium. I'm used to like just a room in the engineering yeah. building. But yeah. we're not that sophisticated with the <laughs> auditorium. I like what you were saying with um, you, f- you felt like you found your people because yeah. I totally agree and resonate with that as well. I felt like the people in Theta Todd just like they just got it. Like everybody yeah. would be crying at the same time over the same exams. And it was like yes. I did have friends outside of Theta Todd, but there was just, you know, some aspect of our friendship or of our connection that we just could never relate to because they weren't in engineering. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's it's sometimes really difficult uh, just even explaining the personalities and cultures that I think sometimes are unique to groups of engineers. Um, like mm-hmm. even one thing, and I actually <laughs> realized this in part when I was listening to one of y'all's episodes, um, there's just a lot of different like language, I guess, idiosyncrasies that engineers use that I feel like a lot of other people don't, that sometimes it's just hard even communicating yeah. with, um, not hard communicating with non-engineers, but there's just different ways that we communicate with each other than with non-engineers, I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> So you are still involved in Data Tall, though. Can you give a little bit of background? Yes. So I currently serve in two. I've held three positions nationally. I currently serve in two. So my first position um, after I graduated was what we call a regional director. So for people that either aren't in Data Tall or aren't in Greek life at all, effectively what a regional director does is they help supervise and mentor um, chapters in a specific region of the country. So I worked primarily in Virginia because that's where I live. And I would just work with them. I would help them plan events. I would help them address issues that they were seeing within their chapter um, and just like guide them. Because when you're in college, I feel like you don't realize that you're an 18 to 22 year old trying to run an entire like organization. And it's, I feel like we all think like, oh yeah, like I'm an adult, like I can do this. But then when you're, after you've graduated, you're like, you're not quite yet. You are legally, but like, let's help you get there. (laughs) Let's help you get there a little <laughs> little quicker, you know, a little more efficiently. Um, yeah. Definitely. And so then after that, I became our national DEI chair, which stands for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, and that's actually a new position and new committee that we started up. And for that one, like, a lot of what I do is again, working with chapters to help them start up their own DEI committee and chair positions and just figure out how to address equity and engagement issues um, at their local level. Um, And then I also Mm -hmm. work at the national level and see like, okay, what sort of strategy or plan can we implement at the national level to make sure that we're being equitable and engage like 
equitable and engaging all of our members and being inclusive of everyone across the organization and not just at an individual chapter. Um, and then from there, yeah, mm-hmm. we just do a lot of like programming, policy review and stuff, um, just trying to like make the organization better overall. Um, and my last position, <laughs> um, I serve as a council delegate. So that is a member of our executive council, which is effectively our board of directors, like for a nonprofit, like we lead the entire organization. Um, So it's a group of nine people who all work to just oversee how all of our operations are going. So we have people working in health and safety, people working in chapter support, people working in programming, people working in like general infrastructure and volunteer management. Um, so it's, it's really, really fun because we all like to say that it's like a chapter um, because there's only like 45 national officers. So it feels like you're part of another chapter, but instead of it literally being oh, your cool. university, it's like, I have a chapter brother. It feels like I have a chapter brother in Oregon and a chapter brother in Texas and a chapter brother in California. Um, And we get together um, sometimes once or twice a year. And then we go to our national conventions and just like going to regional conferences. If you guys got the opportunity to do those when you were an undergrad, it just feels like you're meeting up with old friends. Um, And it's just, it's a whole other level of like engagement in the organization that I really enjoy. It, It's like there's this sense of understanding with all Theta Ta people. Like even if people, people I've met who didn't go to my school and I didn't know I was in college, but they're Theta Ta brothers. They're like, oh yeah, okay, we get it. (laughs) And it's like Um, we have inside jokes even if we've never met each other. Right, exactly. (laughs) Um, We definitely want to get into the bulk of um, your DI. (gasps) DEI chair position because um, we're super excited to talk about that. But before we dive in, I'm just curious, how did you um, figure out how to get involved with Theta Top post grad? Because like, um, was there someone you reached out to um, who was a mentor for you to get into that space? Or did you um, like look on the Theta Top website? Like, can you talk a, a little bit about that? Absolutely. So one of the alumni from my chapters uh, was actually a regional director at the time that I was graduating and I was very good friends with her. Um, And I'd had the opportunity to interact with some of the RDs uh, for our region. And I kind of had an idea that that was something I was interested in doing. So I reached out to her and um, talked to her to learn a little bit more about the position. And then For the actual application process, I was able to attend that year's national convention and actually interact with more national officers and meet students from across the entire country. And uh, so that kind of solidified for me that it was something that I wanted to do and something I wanted to be engaged in. Um, And from there, we actually have a like standard national officer application form or like volunteer application form um, that is available on our website uh, under like the alumni tab um, and it just goes through and like you can apply like for all of the positions through that one form Um, and like for RDs they just ask like or for everyone kind of um, it just asks like hey like why are you interested in this position like what is something from your experience either inside data or outside data tar that you might want to bring to this Um, so like like I said we have a lot of different areas so some people are more interested in chapter support some people are more interested in programs or infrastructure um, So it was just kind of finding what I wanted to do. And I really like mentoring and coaching. So I knew I wanted to work um, in some capacity with younger younger members and students and chapters um, to say like, okay, I did a lot of leadership when I was uh, active in the chapter. And while I hopefully didn't completely burn everything to the ground, um, I know that there are a lot of things I could have done better. And if I can, I want to help you do that thing better so that you can get even further than I got when I was there. Uh, Out of curiosity, do you have like a time commitment that you like for the uh, regional director position versus your current position? What's the difference in, you know, your weekly time commitment for that? Yeah. So I would say we have um, position descriptions uh, on our website that are available under the volunteer page. So if anyone is interested in volunteering, like we have full page descriptions, that's this is everything you would be required to do, every expectation of the position and weekly time commitments. Um, I would say it varies a little bit. So we have some chapters that um, need a little bit more support. 
we have some chapters that <laughs> need a little bit more support um, or are struggling in some ways that other chapters aren't. For me, um, my region had nine chapters at the time um, and was a relatively new region when I moved into it. So I probably spent, um, I would say about three to five hours a week, um, like doing calls with them, sending emails, just sending them reminders. Um, and I would do a lot of one-on-one -on -one calls with them just to make sure I understood their struggles and like where they were, where they wanted to improve or like where they were strong and could support other chapters, um, which is about a standard amount. Some people have a little bit less, some people have a little bit more depending on if there's additional projects that they want to take on. Um, for my current position, it's definitely a lot more especially because I'm currently in like two. Um, but I would say between my two positions, I probably spend almost double that time um, doing various things. So we have, uh, we do a lot of like judicial hearings. We do a lot of policy development um, as well as still meeting with chapters, um, meeting with individuals um, and running various committees and organizations within the fraternity as a whole. So I'm interacting with a lot more pieces of the group and pieces of the puzzle. Um, so yeah, definitely a lot higher <laughs> at the executive level. Um, but a lot of that is because we try to keep the lower levels a bit more manageable and a bit more accessible to people depending on what their time commitment mm -hmm. can be. Um, so you are the uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Chair for Theta Tau, and I want to dive into that a little bit. So um, can you maybe share with our audience, what does that mean to you within Theta Tau, like as an organization, but also within your own personal experience um, within Theta Tau in college? Absolutely. So engineering, no surprise, is a male-dominated field um, and is also largely a, um, a white-dominated field and an able-bodied dominated field um, and a neurotypical dominated field. So for me, um, I think diversity, equity, and inclusion just means making sure that everyone has a seat at the table. And within our organization, I think we do, while we are a professional engineering fraternity, we do place a lot of stock in brotherhood. It means one of our three pillars. And so mm -hmm. if we're really going to be a brotherhood and we're really going to um, try to build those lasting friendships and lasting relationships like we have managed to find with our bigs and with our littles, um, it's important that we make sure everyone feels included and make sure everyone feels actually safe in that environment to be able to build that relationship. So to me, it just, it makes good common sense, you know, if you're going to be any sort of organization to have DEI. And I'm just really proud to like kind of be able to help lead that charge a little bit. Um, and there's so many people across our fraternity that are absolutely passionate about it. Like every other day, I feel like I have a student coming to me saying like, hey, I want to start a DEI committee or I want to start a DEI chair position. Like, what do I do? Like, oh, how awesome. do we get involved? Yeah, it's it's really, really cool to see the passion, um, especially from this like newer generation of engineering students who desperately like want to build that level of engagement and inclusion. Um, and I would say from my own personal experience, I um, not only am a woman in STEM, but I'm a black woman in STEM and I'm also neurodivergent. So for me, um, there have definitely been a lot of times in my life where I just felt like a space I was in wasn't made for me or wasn't meant for me. Um, and even within the mm -hmm. fraternity, um, like I love my brothers and I love my chapter. Um, but there are still times where people like microaggressions still happen. There's still times where people just don't know what they don't know. Um, or we have policies or programs or systems set up in a way that we don't even know is exclusive to some people. Um, so I just think that for my experience, I want to help guide those that are, that have felt similarly to how I have um, in the past, um, help them, Mm -hmm. find ways to make a difference and make a change within their own organization. Um, and if they are coming up against pushback or coming up against conflict because of that, I just kind of want to be that voice of support saying like, hey, you're not alone. There are others of us out here that are like trying to make that difference and trying to push us all forward as an organization. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that this DEI committee was recently started. Um, I'm just curious, when was it made and were you kind of the one that brought this to Theta Shaw's attention or was it kind of like a more people brought yeah. it up? 
Um, just wondering what that process was. Yeah, um, I actually was not the one that brought it up and I will give credit where it's due. Um, Our current executive director, um, uh, Jim Gaffney and one of our other national officers they actually, both of them were white men. Um, they actually came up with the idea after we had done some um, in, like diversity, equity, and inclusion programming for the entire organization. So that was back in October 2020, I want to say. Yes, October 2020, um, we did some virtual DEI programming for the entire organization. Um, we brought in a woman named Monica Johnson, who does speaking engagements um, across the country. And we just brought her in to teach us a little bit more about what DEI means, how we can bring it into our space, um, and how we can start engaging each other on that level. Um, and following that programming, we just got such a um, such a positive level of feedback. Um, and it just, it stimulated so much thought, uh, with all of the national officers that they were like, this is something we like need to be doing more. Like we need to find a way to do more of this programming and to bring more of this education to our members. Um, and so they had the idea to start up a DEI committee, um, to actually make DEI a part of how we plan as an organization and a part of how we like make goals for the future. Um, and I guess because of my involvement um, in that space and like some of the conversations I had already had with those individuals, when they had the idea, they approached me to, to lead that committee um, because of my interest in that and because of my experiences. And also because they didn't necessarily want to be white men at the face of a DEI movement, um, yeah. <laughs> it was just something to be said for itself. Um, not that there's anything yeah. inherently wrong with that, but Optics are a thing that exists. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of how I got involved. And, and to their credit, they're both still heavily involved in, um, in that movement as well. Yeah. Awesome. Spe- speaking of uh, the future of DEI, do you guys have, since it is such a, a new committee, are there some broader long term goals that you're hoping to accomplish? Or what do you think the future looks like for DEI within Theta Talk? Absolutely. Um, so, one of our current goals is to just help as many chapters as possible start up a DI committee or a DI chair position of their own. Um, because as much as, as much programming as we can do at the national level, we can't reach every single member and every single um, like potential new member um, that is coming into our organization. So we really want to empower our chapter officers and our student leaders to be doing this work at their level. Um, and then also we are working on partnering with an uh, external consulting agency that can help our organization as a whole figure out like where we want to go. So we're trying to do an organizational assessment, um, which is effectively where we just um, survey and interview um, and review all of our documentation, review our history, identify where have we had pitfalls as an organization, like where um, in our policies are we maybe unintentionally um, excluding people or how have we unintentionally or intentionally in some cases excluded people in the past? I wanted to ask a little bit, um, uh, not really with Theta Tau, but just in your personal career, have there been times where you have experienced um, that you were treated differently or just felt differently in a situation um, because of your gender? Absolutely. Um, one, One that actually really comes to mind so at my work as a pharmaceutical company, um, I work in capital projects a lot, which effectively means a process that's being started up um, and has not received FDA approval or anything like that. Um, and so the couple of projects I've worked on, I worked on effectively from when the building was first built all the way up to qualifications um, and first clinical batches to the FDA. And there was one project I worked on that we were contracting an external vendor that was helping us val- like sterilize or sorry, validate a sterilization process for a particular system. And this was during COVID and all of our uh, calls were being done virtually. And most of the time we didn't have like video on, but being the only female on the call, obviously you could make out my gender um, from that. Yeah. And there were definitely times, um, it was a team of force. It was me, um, the vendor in, in particular was an older male, I believe in his fifties. Um, and then there were two other men that I was working with that were in their late thirties and early forties. And the vendor was 
constantly just incredibly rude to me. Um, he would talk over me. He would answer questions for me. Um, he wouldn't effectively listen to anything I said. Like there was one time at this point, I have been working at Merck specifically in validation and in sterile processes for about two and a half years. So I was pretty well versed in what all that entailed. I had run qualifications completely on my own. There was uh, there was one time I was trying to say to him um, that this is the particular way, like because of the level of um, evidence or the level of confidence we need to be able to reach in our work for FDA licensure, um, this is the way we need to go about validating the sterilization process. And he basically completely cut me off and started to for lack of a better word, mansplain what sterilization was and how it works. And oh, I was like, my biggest pet peeve, dude, this is literally mansplain. my industry. <laughs> yeah. um, and there was one time, one of the other men on the call directly asked me a question, like said my name and said, hey, from your team's perspective, for your team's purposes, what exactly do we need to meet? What requirements do we need to meet for this to be considered valid? And before I was even halfway through my first sentence, the guy chimes in and starts like completely taking the question away and just answering for me. And I'm like, he said my name. <laughs> like he asked me directly. Yeah. Um, was this the same this was guy? the same guy the same this was yeah we would have weekly calls with him and every call I feel like I could barely get a word in edgewise unless I basically forcefully asserted myself into the conversation um so that was that experience the other two men luckily were very gracious and would kind of go out of their way to ask me questions directly and to call my name and like make sure mm -hmm. that I was kind of getting credit for the things that I was saying and not just being steamrolled by the other guy. Um, and something that I thought was really, really cool that they did was something that I didn't even know. My manager came to me like a week later when we were working on something and said, hey, I was recently talking to one of the other guys on the call. And he said that, you know, the vendor was being incredibly rude to you and just saying all these horrible things um, and that you like really handled yourself very well and like, you know, showed like real leadership skills and real leadership development during that. So just like, good job. And like that actually kind of went on my like I guess achievement record for like skills that I had mm -hmm. developed and it was something that I had mentioned to the conflict to my manager but I had never I was trying not to like complain about it or try not to like make a big deal about it um, but the fact that they went out of their way to sort of stick up for me and tell my manager like what I was dealing with and how I was handling it um, that actually meant a lot to me so that was really cool so you get you get all types in, in construction and manufacturing yeah <laughs> Yeah, definitely. What advice would you give to other women facing the same, you know, situation or yeah. same getting the same treatment? I would say um, remain confident in yourself. Uh, one thing I had to one thing I had to really make sure yeah. I <laughs> one thing I had to really make sure that <laughs> like, I yeah. was holding true to was what I knew and what my experiences were. And I kind of had to say to myself, like, you know what experience you have, you know what you know, and you know what your responsibility here is. Um, and there was a reason I was put on that team. There was a reason my manager had the confidence to have me lead that project. Um, and I kind of just had to bolster myself up a little bit and say like you don't deserve to be getting steamrolled by this guy like yes he may know um some more than you about this specific thing and that's why you're consulting him but you still know your field better than he does um and mm -hmm. it took a lot of also reaching out to my manager who was also a woman who had been in the industry for 20 years and when i was telling her these things she completely sympathized and at no point did she try to minimize the issue i would say my other piece of advice based on that is find who is in your circle like find who your supporters actually are um like the two other men on the call like once i knew that they stuck up for me i already had a good professional relationship with them but once i knew that they stuck up for me the way they did um i kind of went out of my way to have more conversations with them to engage with them more um and just really build those connections so once you find um, someone or a group of people that you know has your back, um, make sure, one, that you reciprocate that to build that relationship and then lean on that when you need mm -hmm. to, when you have those instances of someone questioning your abilities or questioning your basic intelligence um, sometimes. Uh, just make sure that you, you, know, you know who will have your back and you know who you can go to to sort of refill your cup a little bit. 
definitely. So going off of that, just because I like, I really like the connection of, you know, validation. I'm the only woman validation on, you know, member of my team. Um, So we briefly mentioned it's very hard to say no to individuals and validation. Um, Out of curiosity, what advice or like, what have you learned in your years of validation that kind of helps that? And this is honestly for probably (laughs) my personal use, but in general, you know, what other struggles have you faced and kind of how, what advice do you have? So for me, um, I found it helpful because of my experience and the path of roles that I took. Um, I was given a lot of responsibility really early on just because of the nature of our project. Um, Most of us at the sort of entry level positions were all straight out of college. And because of the capital project, we were really fast paced. So I think three months into my position, I was already leading a qualification for one of our major utility systems which is not an experience, uh, a lot or an opportunity, a lot of people would have gotten the chance to get. Um, And so because of that, I had to learn really quickly. And I learned a lot more of the big picture of everything that needs to happen really quickly. So for me, the way I handle situations when I have to say no, I try to really think about what what the no means, and why um, I need to say no. So if it's, if the answer is no, because the FDA says no, then the answer is no. <laughs> if the if the answer is no, mm-hmm. because this global requirement says that we must meet this level of confidence, or we must meet this level of evidence for this, then it's really easy for me to point to that piece of, um, point to that source or point to that reference and say, it's not me. It's not coming from me. I'm on your side. Yeah. Like, let's figure out a way to do this. But this piece of paper says that you can't, <laughs> you know? Um, So, and sometimes I would even go to my manager if I really felt like I had to. Um, Although I try to do that a little less, the more responsibility I get, I want to, you know, stand on my own two feet a little bit more. Um, But for me, it was a lot of making sure I I actually understood the reason why and learning as much as I could about the system so that when someone gave me pushback or when someone said, no, that's actually not required or I don't think that's necessary, I could say, actually, no, I know that it's necessary and here's why and here's like the evidence-based reason and the value that we'll, de- that we'll deliver to our patients by saying no right now until we're actually able to say yes. Um, so just making sure that I, I'm thinking about who I'm sticking up for. You know, it's not just, oh, I have to argue with this guy. It's no, I'm sticking up for millions of patients across the world. I'm sticking up for the next mm-hmm. person in the process who, if we get this wrong, they're going to have a whole mess of trouble on their hands. Um, and just thinking about, um, you know, what is the actual, what is the actual reasoning? What is the big picture here? Definitely. Awesome. Thank you for that. I really like that Keeping perspective. Keeping it in my back pocket. Yeah. Of like thinking of who are you saying no for? It's not just, you know, all the people that are affected by a process. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to get your perspective on, you know, as your experience being the, the DEI chair, and then also just your personal experience as a woman in STEM, what do you think that we as women and also men can do to empower not only women, but also other minorities in the STEM industries? Oh, that is a great question. Um, Allyship is something that's really hard to define and really hard to actually understand what it means. Um, But I think it starts with listening. Um, It starts with Like I I tell my friends, like if I say that I had an experience or I say that something is happening to me, it starts with just believing me. Um, Like when I, like I know like when I tell you all about um, experiences I have with older men in my industry, I know that you'll believe me because I'm sure you've had similar experiences yourselves. Um, But it comes with, allyship comes with, even if you haven't had that experience, if someone tells you that they have, just believe them. Sometimes, yes, there can be cases of someone misinterpreting intentions or someone misinterpreting tone or or intent or something like that. But at the end of the day, that person felt belittled or that person felt excluded. That person felt like they like space wasn't being made for them. Um, And the more you listen, the more we all learn to listen and accept each other and give each other just that space and grace to come as we are um, with our individual Mm -hmm. backgrounds that's really where it starts. And I think once we, 
once we've listened and once we've internalized that, then we can say like, okay, well then what can I do to stick up for that person? Um, and that, I think, is sometimes the harder piece because oftentimes we don't know ourselves or the other person might not know what exactly they need. Um, but the more we work together and the more we learn to relate to each other, the easier that will come, I think. Awesome. Um, and in relation to both your involvement in data, your current involvement in data taught and, you know, your current position and validation do you see yourself, like, where do you see yourself in five years in the same kind of chair position? Or are you hoping to pursue like a different role? And not five years, it could be like within the year, just, in, just out of curiosity. Um, I'm still not sure. So right now, my role in Data Taw, I'm taking on more of a management role, um, which leadership is not new for me, but personnel management is sort of. Um, and I'm leaning a little bit more into like strategic planning and thinking about big picture goals for an organization. And I really want to continue down that path and learn more um, as I get more into coaching and mentoring, um, bringing that into my management style and bringing that into how I relate to other members of the organization. Um, and so I think I, I think I want to stay um, either as a DEI chair um, well, involved in DEI. I will, I will be not staying as the chair of the committee, but I'll be, I'll be remaining involved with the committee uh, moving forward. And I think I want to stay working with the executive council and figuring out um, what can we do as a body to help move this entire organization forward. Um, I think that's something that is becoming more and more of a passion of mine because uh, I have I think such a such a clear vision of just what Theta Ta can be, um, because mm -hmm. as much value as we've delivered to some of our members, like myself, and I hope like you both, um, there's a lot of members that aren't able to get the same value either because of their particular chapter experience or struggles that they had as an individual or as a student. Um, and I think the more we can build a community um, around our members, um, the more we can support each other. So I would, I would love to remain engaged at the highest levels to make sure that that happens. Um, what do you think that we can do, um, you know, us three here talking together, our listeners or anyone in general, yeah. um, what do you think we can do to get more representation for women and minorities in STEM? Um, I think it comes with challenging the authoritative bodies um, when there's, uh, I don't know, it's it's hard to, to quantify exactly, especially when you're not uh, involved in those conversations. But I think when we have uh, instances of even a professor um, like belittling a female student um, or even just saying something mm -hmm. that clearly makes that individual feel uncomfortable, um, making sure that we're sticking up for each other, making sure that we're challenging those voices, um, no matter who is quote unquote above you in an organizational sense, at the end of the day, we're all people and we're all equal. And even if that person is your instructor or is your administrator, um, they're no better or worse than you. Um, and your voice is just as important as theirs. And I think um, the more we empower each other and the more we challenge those voices against us and against um, other marginalized identities, um, the more we can affect change. I love that. So going back to uh, your current position, you mentioned that you're mentoring. Um, what are some skills or aspects of mentoring that you didn't expect to need, um, but you learned, you know, while you were mentoring kind of in the moment? It was just something that you might not have been prepared for, but um, you were able to develop those skills. Um, active listening is a big one and I think way bigger than a lot of people think. Um, something that I'm still working on to some degree is really listening when someone is talking and not just kind of waiting for your own turn to speak, um, but yeah. really internalizing <laughs> what they're saying to you and what that means for them. Um, I think there's a lot that like humans are, are great at interpretation. We're great at finding symbolism and stuff like that and making connections. Um, 
And a lot of times we use that in a way that, oh, that person said this, that makes me think of this. And now I'm thinking of all these other things instead of listening to them. Um, but if we really focus in, um, I'm, I'm trying to learn more to focus in on what that person is saying and sometimes read between the lines a little bit um, and try to understand like, okay, you said these words to me, but what additional meaning can I glean from that? What might be, what maybe could I learn about you from you saying that to me? And how can that guide the way I mentor you? Um, because for me, it also takes a lot of understanding that not everyone has the same goals that I do. Um, success doesn't look the mm -hmm. same for everybody. Um, and I'm the type of person that loves to stay busy and loves to be challenged and loves to do a million things. Not everyone likes to do that. Some people like to be really fulfilled at their job, but then come home and simply do a hobby or simply hang with their family um, and, and have that self-care moment. Um, so I think making sure that I'm paying attention to what their goals are and make sure that I'm driving them towards those goals and not what I think their goals should be. Do you think your passion for Theta Ta and like your involvement in the executive committee post-grad has helped you with your current role, either like your mental health or your mindset, just having yeah. something else to be passionate about, or maybe like skills you've learned in Theta Ta that you can translate to your current um, professional role? Absolutely. Um, doing data taught, while sometimes can be tiring, depending on the nature of the activity, is really bucket filling for me. Um, so going to mm -hmm. a national convention and being able to see 100 plus members all hanging out and meeting each other, um, or even just getting on a virtual call with a couple of other national officers that I'm friends with. And it starts out as a business meeting, but then it devolves into just fun conversation and banter. Um, and it's, it's like sometimes being back in that chapter room um, with all of my old chapter brothers and pledge brothers. Um, so that's, that's really, really fulfilling. And especially after a long day of work, sometimes I'm initially dreading a Theta Tall meeting that I have, but then I sit down and I get on camera and I'm like, oh, right, you guys are my friends. <laughs> so that, that can be really, really fun. Um, as far as leadership development, uh, yeah, it's doing a lot for me in terms of, again, learning management um, and learning strategic planning, um, all of which are things that industries do, like large companies, um, four to 500 mm -hmm. companies and stuff do that type of development and that type of future thinking. Um, and in the role that I was in at my job, I wasn't involved in those conversations. I wasn't involved in that type of work. Um, and so being in Theta Ta and the opportunities I've gotten in Theta Ta have given me um, the opportunities to see, okay, this is what management actually looks like. Um, these are the pitfalls. These are the things that I have to learn to be better at it. Um, and this is what it means to be on a board of directors for a nonprofit organization. Um, and it actually does involve a lot of real world leadership skills, a lot of real world soft skills, communication skills um, that can be applied anywhere. And there are a lot of people that will put their data ta national officer experience on their resume um, for real world management positions and real world development positions. I like what you said about having a long day of work, but then coming back to have to do a chapter. Cause I feel like I felt like that when I was in college, sometimes I'd be like, yeah. Oh, like Mondays would be my busiest with so many classes. And I did not want to go to chapter, but then every time I did go to chapter, I was like, okay, I'm so glad I came. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, so you mentioned that you have more of a managerial role now in Theta Ta. Do you see yourself um, in industry wanting to pursue a, a managerial role or do you want to stay more technical? Um, I'm moving a bit more managerial because I'm discovering a passion that I have for teaching and education that I didn't really, I, I guess I knew that I had as a kid, but I didn't in reflect on that. So um, back in high school, I did a lot of tutoring um, and I did some peer-to-peer -peer mentoring even back then. And at the time it was just, oh, I'm good at this class. You're not doing as well in this class. Yeah, I'll help you with your homework or I'll help you study or something like that. Um, but that was a big part of my development. And at my work, because of my the specific field that I work in and the fact that I lead so many systems, I'm often responsible for training people on different activities re relating to those. Um, and at this point, I've trained so many people that I got to the point of like, 
this is just a thing that I enjoy doing and I kind of like it more than yeah. the rest of my job. And so I went to my manager and I was like, hey, can this just be my job? Um, and I am lucky <laughs> enough that she was giving me the opportunity to um, expand more in that field. And they're actually giving me the opportunity to start up a mentorship program for our new hires um, and kind of do training a little more full time, um, still with some validation stuff mixed in. So I'm thinking, uh, in my management style, I like to bring in that sort of mentorship and coaching method where it's a little less like I'm your taskmaster, I'm your supervisor and you have to do X, Y, and Z and a little more of like, okay, where are you struggling? Where are you succeeding? How can we make sure that we get you to succeeding more and struggling less? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really I really like that connection with being a manager and, you know, connecting teaching with that, because that is not something I would think now I feel silly. Cause I'm like, you know, thinking back, I'm like, okay, obviously, but I feel like that's not the first thing that comes to my mind. So I really like yeah, that. I feel like it's not for and a lot of people. Um, and there's, mm -hmm. you know, an old saying in the work world in general that, you know, people don't quit their jobs, they quit their managers. Um, and I think if more mm. managers focused on coaching and focused on actual development um, rather than task management, um, I think potentially we would have a lot more successful collaboration on teams. Yeah. Definitely. And Definitely. you can see how passionate you are about teaching and mentorship just by this conversation. Yeah. So, <laughs> awesome. Um, and then out of curiosity, so how many DEI chapter or yeah committees have you helped um, initiate at different chapters? Do you know? Um, so I've worked with a couple dozen at this point. I've actively helped probably half a dozen individuals. I consulted with half a dozen individuals on starting one at their individual chapters just in the past year um, since I like wow. actually no. In the past like seven months, I would say, since our last convention, um, I've, I've worked with about uh, six individuals. And then we have a little over 20 right now that are established or actively being established. Yeah. Awesome. Is there anything that current Theta Tau chapters need to do to, you know, if they don't have a DEI chapter? Because I'm just thinking like Miami, I don't think we had one, but that would be a really great addition. So if there are you know, for our listeners who do want to start one, are there any actionable steps that they can take to implement that in their own chapter? Yeah, so I would say the first thing, um, find your cohort um, and your chapter. Uh, I think it's the most difficult thing for a single individual to try to affect that change and not because a, they can't or one person can't make that difference, but just because sometimes it can feel defeating to think that you're the only person um, interested in or the only person who actually think it matters. Um, so for me, uh, a lot of people that I've talked to start with just like having conversations with your e-board, with your regent um, and seeing like, you know, how do you guys, like, what do you guys think about this? If you're not already a chapter officer, um, bring it up to either your brotherhood committee chair, bring it up to your regent um, and sort of gauge some interest. And I think sometimes you might get pushback. Uh, sometimes you might find someone saying, oh yeah, I actually think that's a great idea. I just don't know how to get it started. Um, so starting by finding that cohort and building, um, building that sort of bond together and saying, okay, well, like what issues um, have we identified or why, why do we think this is necessary in our own chapter? Um, and a lot of times like that will inform where you can go with it. For some people, um, they just do it to help member engagement, to help people feel more of a brotherhood within the community. For some people, they are identifying active issues of exclusion um, and active issues with inequity within their chapters that they directly want to address. So kind of figuring out um, what is our purpose for this? Like what direction do we want this committee or this chapter to go in? Um, and making sure that you're collaborating with each other, uh, making sure that you're reaching out and not excluding people in your effort to not exclude people. Um, so always <laughs> yeah. making sure that you have the right people in the room for conversations and, and getting, we call it buy-in um, in you know engineering world, but um, just actively reaching out, having conversations. And if people want to be on board, let them on board. Awesome. And what advice would you give to, you know, a freshman undergraduate student to get the most out of their experience in Data Talk? So I would say one, um, you get 
as much out as you put in. Um, that said, mm -hmm. taking care of yourself is important. So finding your niche in the organization, we have so many different forms of leadership, so many different forms of engagement. Um, like fatherhood, service, and professional development are really just the beginning. A lot of chapters do a lot of like marketing stuff uh, with apparel, with um, publications. We have like a gear magazine that you can, if you're interested in like journalism and writing, um, you can submit articles for that. Um, if you're interested in anything that the national organization is doing. So if you're interested in DEI, like a lot of people think that they can only get involved with the national level as an alumnus, but that's not true. Um, students can volunteer on national committees. Um, we also have a student advisory council that directly interacts with the executive council. Um, so there's a ton of different ways to get involved um, if that's what you're interested in. But even if you're a person that's not directly interested in being regent or being a committee head, um, finding what you want to get out of this organization that can just be brotherhood that can just be a group of people to look over your resume a group of people to go get coffee with mm -hmm. um, a group of people to hang out with on a thursday night um, and if that's what you're looking for that's perfectly fine um, and engage with people at that level and see just get different perspectives get different experiences and learn more about um, the engineering world and, and the community around you Definitely. Yeah. I love what you said about finding your niche because I, um, I mean, with this podcast, love, you know, t talking about women in STEM. Yeah. So I love outreach and stuff. So for me, that looks like um, the recruitment chair. I love, I was yeah. like, everybody come join Theta Ta, you know, like, <laughs> so that's totally true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think recruitment is something that some some people struggle with because like for me um i can be like the friendly bubbly person and like help recruit people but um that sometimes is difficult for me because i actually am very very introverted so for me like sitting down a little more one-on-one -on -one and saying like okay let's talk about this specific thing is like more my area mm -hmm. so i would attend rush events but i was not a huge fan of like being the recruiter and i think the more we yeah. allow people to say like hey that's not my thing but i can help in this way yeah. you know i think the more we make room for that and the more we allow that the more people can find find their niche Awesome. Well, we usually close out every interview by asking this one question, which is knowing what you know now, what advice would you give to your younger self? Number one, relax. <laughs> um, yeah. Like, girl, life we is too short. To that. <laughs> um, yeah. yes. There was so many times that I was stressing over grades is a huge one, especially for any like highly academic focused individual. Um, but I was always constantly having to be in a lot of things. And that is partly because I do get enjoyment out of it. And it is bucket filling for me to have things to sort of keep me busy or to be challenged by. But recognizing like, okay, tonight is not a night that you have to do 10 hours of work. Tonight is a night that you're allowed to yeah. sit down, have a glass of wine and drink and watch mm -hmm. Netflix, you know? Um, yeah. And, and kind of giving myself the same space that I would try to give to others. Um, and, and with that, recognizing your value um, and learning how to advocate for yourself. Um, there are a lot of times I am more than willing to speak up on someone else's behalf, but when I feel like I'm the only person being slighted or I'm the only person being um, being affected, I'm like, oh, well, it, it, if as long as the group is fine, like, it's okay. Like, I don't need to speak up and saying, yeah. no, you're also worthy. <laughs> like, if, if you would speak up for someone yeah. else and someone else would speak up for you, why shouldn't you speak up for yourself? Awesome. awesome. Well, thank you so much, Raven, for being on the of podcast. Course. I think you provided a, a really awesome perspective and just, you know, I think our listeners can learn a lot, especially those who are involved in Theta Talk. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much. Of course. This was really, yeah, really fun. Thank Thanks you. guys for the conversation. And just for our listeners to know, Raven also has her own podcast with her Theta Talk <laughs> bag. I wanted to emphasize that, which I think is awesome. So if you want to plug yourself where can they find yeah. you if you're on social media, your podcast name? Absolutely. So my podcast is called Boozicals, B-O-O-Z-I-C-A-L-S. Um, we make craft cocktails and pair them with musicals that we want to watch. Um, and we review the I musicals while we get drunk together. <laughs> 
and then because <laughs> both of us grew up playing music at the end we once we're good and drunk we will play a song from the musical with no practice um so it's just a fun thing to do um we started jamming together a lot in college and it just turned into this um so we try to use that to promote like music education for underprivileged individuals um especially children like inner cities and stuff like that that might not have access to music education um so we partnered with a few different organizations for that but if you're interested you can find us pretty much anywhere podcasts are found so like spot Spotify, Podbean, Stitcher, um, a lot of those major hosting sites, as well as Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, etc. Um, our podcast name is, again, Boozicals, B-O-O-Z-I-C-A-L-S. Uh, you can also find us on Instagram, at Boozicals, and email us at boozicals at gmail.com. Um, and then for Theta Ta stuff, if you are interested in learning more about Theta Ta, you can go to our website, theta ta t-h-e-t-a t-a-u dot org um or if you're interested in learning more about dei or just want to like i guess reach out to me about my experience in theta ta you can contact me at raven.smith at theta dot org and that's a wrap on our interview with raven we learned all about theta ta from a different aspect i feel like we talk about it all the time so it was so fun to learn about how you know, her experience was and her current yeah. experience even after post-grad because we definitely I feel like don't have that much involvement currently with it but yeah we'd love to get more involved which yeah some and exciting things might be coming up in the future yeah all right well um if you guys want to follow us on social media Lexi where can they find you they can find me at engineer Lexi on TikTok and Instagram and you can find me at Libby B on the label on TikTok and Instagram. And then our um, podcast, you can find us on TikTok and Instagram at my best friends and engineer. And on YouTube at BFB podcast. Amazing. Okay. Shall we close off this amazing episode with Raven? Oh yes. This is like the fourth time we've done it. All I know. Okay. Let's just, let's just say how we like would normally talk. I'm just yeah don't even look at me ready like don't look at the video ready okay Okay. all right I'm Lexi and I'm Libby and thanks for listening and thanks for listening to my best friends and engineer what did you say my best friend's a little sister (laughs) no I was talking and you didn't start talking so then I started laughing